Hello and welcome to the channel. This is Ignu Beer VCH. This is dedicated to Ignu BA Psychology Honours. As we always say, whether you are starting a new journey with Ignu, seeking an exam revision or maybe a little clarification on some topics, this channel is for you. If you are watching us for the first time, welcome again and thank you for watching. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you won't lose us to the never-ending feed on YouTube. So in this series in BPCC 102, today we are covering the second part of the second chapter, Neurons and Nerve Impulse. Today we will talk about synaptic transmission, structure and functions of a synapse, neurotransmitters and neuroplasticity. Let's begin with synaptic transmission. Imagine neurons are like people passing notes in the classroom. They need a way to share information and that's, you know, there's where synapses comes in. As we discussed in the previous video, when an action potential, a signal, travels down a neuron's action, it reaches the end, which, is called, which we call the terminal buttons. This is where one neuron meets another at a synapse. Think of a synapse like a meeting point between two friends. Okay. Now this synapses can happen in three places of the receiving neuron. On its branches, it's called dendrites, the main body, soma, or its own tail, that is action. So synapses can be called exodendritic, exosomatic or exoxonic. There are two kinds of synapses, electrical and chemical. Electrical synapses are like the direct phone calls. Neurons have channels that come really close to each other, making it easy for ions to pass from one to another. It's quick and goes in both directions, like a two-way street. Another is chemical synapses. So imagine one neuron sending a message to another by tossing a note across a gap. In our case, this gap is called synaptic cleft. The sender, that is presynaptic neuron, releases tiny messenger chemicals called neurotransmitters from their terminal buttons. These chemicals go into the gap and reaches receptors on the receiver, that is postsynaptic neuron's membrane. It's like one person is tossing a note to another who is ready to catch it. Okay. So most of the time our brain uses this chemical synapses to share information. So when you think, move or feel something, it's like a big game of passing notes between two neurons. Well, many neurons. So let's uh, break down what a synapse looks like. Okay, what it is exactly. You can picture it like a message exchange between two friends. There are three important parts, synaptic nerve, synaptic cleft and plasma membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. So let's look at the synaptic nerve. The synaptic knob are the ends of the terminal buttons. Inside this knob, there are a number of vesicles filled with special chemicals called neurotransmitters. Okay, now let's look at the synaptic cleft. This is the gap or space between two neurons. Information can't jump directly from one neuron to another. Okay, it's like they need a bridge. So the information from first neuron changes from an electrical message to a chemical one and crosses this gap and again turns back into an electrical message for the second neuron. So the third is plasma membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. This is the membrane of the neuron where the information is going. Certain receptors are present on this membrane where the neurotransmitter molecules come and attach themselves. So when one neuron wants to tell the other something, they send neurotransmitter across a gap which is called synaptic cleft to the other neuron's plasma membrane, yes. And that's how the message gets through. It's like passing notes in the class but with special chemicals. Now let's break down how a message travels across a synapse step by step. But uh, before that, let's understand that there are two neurons, okay? The neuron that wants to send a message is presynaptic and the neuron that's ready to receive is a postsynaptic neuron, okay? So when the nerve impulse reaches the end of a presynaptic neuron's action, calcium ions they quickly move into the presynaptic neuron's membrane. This speedy calcium rush is like a signal for what comes next. Okay, so inside the synaptic nerve, there are small bags called vesicles. When these chemical ions arrive, these vesicles move around and merge with the neuron walls. It's like they're getting ready to deliver something. Okay, so when the vesicles merge with the neuron's wall, they release special chemicals called neurotransmitters. These chemicals are like the messages that the neurons want to send. Okay, so the neurotransmitters now have to cross the gap or the synaptic cleft to reach the other side. So they move around the synaptic cleft 
and try to reach the plasma membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. This membrane has a special receptor. The neurotransmitter, they try to catch these receptors and when they do, they stick together. Okay, so this catch and bind action causes something called a postsynaptic potential. There are two types, excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So the neurotransmitters cause the sodium ions to come inside the membrane much faster than the potassium ions moving out from the membrane and make the inside of the membrane more positive. So this is called EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. It gets the neuron excited. So once the threshold of the EPSP is reached, the action potential is initiated and the postsynaptic membrane. The inhibited neurotransmitters open the potassium channels causing the potassium ion to move inside. Okay. This makes the membrane much more negative than at the resting potential. This temporary state of hyperpolarization is known as inhibitory postsynaptic potential. If the neurotransmitters make the inside of the membrane more negative, it's called IPSP. It calms the neuron down. But uh, what about the neurotransmitters that didn't find receptors? They are sent back to the synaptic knob. There they are either used by going back into the vesicles, you know this process is called reuptake, or broken down by special enzymes. So it's like a well organized process where messages are delivered, caught and if ne needed, cleaned up for the next round. Do you know that some drugs like cocaine can interfere with the reuptake process, affecting how messages are passed in the nervous system? Now let's understand why a synapse is so important. So synapse, it acts like a bridge that connects different neurons together. This allows us to send messages between them and these messages control our actions and thoughts. So when synapses don't work well, it can affect our behavior and even lead to conditions like depression or schizophrenia. Okay, and synapses are like traffic signs that make sure messages travel in one direction only. Okay, but how? Since neurotransmitters are present only in the presynaptic membrane and receptor molecules can only be found in the postsynaptic membrane, due to this, impulses travel in one direction only. Okay, and synapses they help in bringing together messages from different neurons. It's like gathering puzzle pieces to see the whole picture. Okay, also think of synapses like as a bouncer at the club. Okay, they only let in strong messages. If a message isn't strong enough, that is less than 40 millivolt, it doesn't get through. This helps filter out unnecessary information so our body doesn't react to every little thing. Okay, so now let's move on to neurotransmitter. We have been throwing around the word neurotransmitter all around, but what is it exactly? Let's find out. So neurotransmitters are like tiny little messengers inside our nerve cells. When these nerve cells send signals, they release these messengers. There are more than 100 different kinds of them. So the neurotransmitters, they can be grouped into three categories of small molecule neurotransmitters like amino acids, monoamines and acetylcholine and even unconventional neurotransmitters. There is one group of large molecule neurotransmitter called the neuropeptides. Now when these messengers do their job, they usually have one or two effects. They either make the nerve cell more active, this process is called exciting, okay, they either excite it or they calm it down, that is inhibited. Okay, but some of them can switch between these roles depending on what's needed. Now let's look at the functions. Well, I'm not going to bore you with the details as they're quite a handful, but uh, don't worry. I'm dropping the names of these neurotransmitters along with the functions in this slide. You can pause the video here and take the time you need. It's been made easy for your understanding. Okay. But let's discuss one example. Let's look at the example. Okay. Anti-anxiety medications like diazepam is agonist for GABA. Now, what is GABA? It's short for gamma aminobutyric acid. Okay, it's like a calming agent in our brain. It's a natural chemical that helps reduce nerve cell activity. So when GABA is around, it tells our brain to slow down and relax and also help us feel less anxious and more peaceful. 
Now you can say GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. You remember? Neurotransmitter either excite or inhibit. Yes. So you can say GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and the inhibitory action is increased by the drug and the drug directly calms the specific brain areas that play a role in controlling anxiety. Okay. Well, we are moving to neuroplasticity. In the past, people thought that if the central nervous system got damaged, it was pretty much it. It was permanent. They also believed that once our brain become an adult, you know, it couldn't really change much. But recent researches by brain scientists starting in the 1980s has shown that our brain can actually keep changing and adapting. This ability is called neuroplasticity. It means that our brain can alter the structure and functions in response to experiences, injuries or even tough times. So even when you are all grown up, your brain is still flexible and can learn new things. And as we go through life, our brain cell changes due to these things, you know, like learning our genes and the world around us. Sometimes when there's an injury, a trauma, our brain can reorganize itself. It turns out that even though some neurons die over time, our brain can make new ones, especially in the hippocampus. This area handles our memory and emotion. We'll talk about it in the next chapter. And the olfactory bulb, which is linked to the smell. The food we eat and the environment we are in can impact this process. A healthy diet and a stimulating environment is good for brain cell growth. On the flip side, lack of sleep and stress can slow down this growth. So when things go wrong in our brain, like damage or disease, here's what happens. So first is neural degeneration. This is when our brain cell starts to break down. It can be caused by diseases, natural processes or other factors. Think of it like a wear and tear on our brain wires. Another is neural regeneration. Our brain does not give up easily. It tries to fix those broken wires. In the central nervous system, neurons don't recover well in adult mammals. However, in the peripheral nervous system, they still give it a shot. Although full recovery may not always happen. Okay. Still, our brain can find ways to grow and repair even if it's not always perfect. Next is neural reorganization. When our brain goes through damage, it doesn't just sit still. It tries to reorganize itself. It rearranges connections, strengthens the old one and sometimes even grow new brain cells. It's like our brain's way of saying, I won't let this stop me. Okay. So next is recovery. Recovering brain function after damage is tough and scientists are still figuring it out. Educations and intelligence seem to give our brain a head start. Doing exercises for the brain and body can help too. And scientists are trying some experiments like uh, transplanting neurons, you know, and they are being explored to help the CNS damage like Parkinson's disease. So the recent advance in research by neuroscientists post 1980s have concluded that the brain has the ability to constantly change the structure and functions of the cell in the response to any experience, injury or any trauma. And this is known as neural plasticity. So that's the end of this video. Let's recap quickly the topics we covered today. Synaptic transmission, structure and functions of a synapse, neurotransmitters and neuroplasticity. With this video, we have completed the first block. In the next video, we will start the second block with the third chapter in BPCC 102. Thank you for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you have any doubts and feedback, please drop them in the comment box below or DM us directly in any given social media. Please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button below for more content. Follow us on Instagram for quick notes and updates and join the discussion on Telegram for all your questions. Links are down below in the description. See you in next video. Until then, stay curious, stay engaged and remember, yeah, you got this.